Hello everybody, I'm Raphael Perry and it's time for some more Blood Sword. Let's pick up where we left off, and I'll repeat the previous section for continuity's sake, because why not? It was a good section. You enter the gatehouse. A number of pallid men and women in dusty finery shuffle around the floor in a mournful dance, although you can hear no music. Gradually they notice you, and one by one they stop dancing. At last you feel all eyes on you as you cross the hall. You look back. The dancers have gone, and now you see just a room festooned with cobwebs in which large grey spiders run frantically to and fro. Somewhere, as if from a great distance, you hear shrieks, whether of mirth or anguish, you cannot tell, and a discordant music of jangling bells, pipes, and lyres. You approach a stone door bearing this inscription on its lintel. Here is thy journey's end. After life's fitful fever, sleep thee well. You push at the door, which opens with a groan. That's a pretty ominous message. Eventually, the distant music stops. You wait in silence and grim darkness for several heartbeats, then a grey glimmer partially illuminates the gloom. With light comes hope and a one-point healing roll, because why not start the session by failing one of those? Woohoo! Spend a point, get three points back. Uh, Brother Kern will give a point to Remy and a point to himself. Well, two points to himself. Taking them both back up to 12 endurance, the other two party members are already at full health. You see that you are standing in a chamber with eight very high walls. In front of you looms a door. It shimmers in the light cast by four candles set on the floor. You walk up to them and see they are connected by lines of silver dust forming a square within which runic symbols have been chalked. If you wish, you can take the candles and or the dust. You may do so. I'm going to presume the candles take up one space. At this point, uh, 10 items, 10 items, 10 items, and 10 items. Everybody's pack is full, so we're going to have to leave some stuff behind. I'm going to actually suggest that Brother Kern and Ariadne leave their bedrolls behind. They can pick them up on the way back out of the castle, right? Um, the four candles and silver dust. Let's, uh, that's two items. I think, ah. I think with all this ominous foreshadowing, Sir Alwyn is going to suggest that since he's been in so much danger and he's had one or two really close shades of death recently he probably shouldn't be the person carrying the scabbard of the blood sword right now he's been confident up to this point but maybe brother kern should be trusted with it and then ariadne can take the silver dust And he can carry the four candles. Four candles! It's got to be done. Four candles! Nah! Four candles! Candles for forks! Hey, brilliant stuff. Are you in a multiplayer party or are you on your own? There is more than one character in the party. So we'll have a one point healing roll for that little. But nope, lost a point again. Look, I'll try. I'll try a two point roll. Yeah, probably next time actually. Okay, so 
multiplayer party because we're using the single player team option and because these annoying things are down there in the bottom I have to do this this way the area of floor that is covered with runes looks dangerous you decide to edge past it with a sigh of relief you reach the door ahead of you only to stop dead as a figure out of your worst nightmares steps out from it you see a grinning, rotted corpse, dressed in an executioner's apparel, its face wriggling with worms that drop to the floor from its putrefying eye sockets. The scythe it holds in its dead hands is even now swinging viciously towards the first person in the battle order, which would be Sir Alwyn. There is nothing he can do to prevent the blow from striking home. As it does, he just evaporates into a thin mist. Sir Alwyn's gone. Now, I have played this book before a very long time ago, and there is a blatantly obvious reason why I handed off the scabbard to Brother Kern at this point. Technically, I didn't have to. There, there's an argument for saying I didn't have to, but I've done it. I'm not even going to make a healing roll that section, okay? That is shocking. The remaining heroes are absolutely gutted. And somewhere outside of this game, someone's going to say Sean Bean is dead again. I know. The executioner holds his side alo scythe aloft in triumph. Amid peals of hideous laughter that bubble up out of his decayed throat, he vanishes into the same mist that is all that remains of Sir Alwyn. The player who vanished must play the monsters now. However, you should retain his or her character sheet for the moment. You look at the fading strands of mist, then shrug off your sad thoughts and march onwards. You enter a long, silent gallery. Looking to your right, you see a line of huge mirrors hung along the wall. In them, you see yourself reflected, and also reflections of bizarre portraits that seem to hang on the left-hand wall. However, when you turn to look at the left wall, you see mirrors hanging there, apparently reflecting a row of portraits along the right wall. You find the effect very disorienting. Very di and also very disorientating. And it serves only to disturb your uneasy thoughts all the more. After a long time, you reach the end of the gallery. Here it intersects with a ca cavernous passage, perhaps actually a wide, high-walled avenue, as you think you can glimpse stars far above. The gallery is on a higher level than the passageway, which you can reach by descending a wide flight of stairs. Now. Just imagine for a moment how that event might have played out if there was only one hero in the party. I will let you know that if there is only one hero in the party, it does play out slightly differently. Below. Now the gallery is on a higher level than the passageway, which you can reach by descending a wide flight of stairs. Below, near the foot of the stairs, you see an eerie procession. Cowled figures with large blue candles carrying a shrouded body on a bier. They pass along the avenue with slow, silent tread. We should sneak down the stairs and try and get a closer look, or we could just wait for them to go past. We should get a closer look. We want to know what's going on. They're carrying a body in a procession as if to a funeral. Screwing up your courage, you make your way down the stairs and make a two-point healing roll. Two points lost. The unbelievability of Map Tool's cursed healing rolls continues. <laughs>
screwing up your courage, you make your way down the stairs and hide in the shadows of the balustrade at the bottom. As the eerie procession passes, you see by the light of the blue torches that the figure on the bier is none other than that of the friend you lost when the executioner attacked. Sir Alwyn appears to be dead, however, and his face is as white as the winding sheet wrapped around his body. Four unlit lanterns stand at the corners of the bier. The pallbearers ignore you as you march as they march past. That's unusual. Those lanterns would normally be lit if going to a funeral. We could attack them. We could follow them. We could go in the opposite direction and get the hell away from this whole scene. Or we could use an item. I think we should follow them and see where they are going. But first, we will attempt another two-point healing roll. And we'll get four points back. So that brings Brother Kern back up to 11. And ever so slowly, we're inching our way towards full health, although it doesn't seem to be happening anytime soon. You follow St. Alwyn's beer at a short distance. Soon, the procession comes to a huge cathedral-like structure its steeples soaring into the night air. With a gasp, you realize that it is made entirely of bone. The steeples are cones of human skulls, the buttresses human thigh bones, and the walls are pulverized fragments of rib cages and arms. As you enter the darkness, you smell a pungent incense mingling with the powerful scent of decay. In front of you, the pallbearers' trailing robes disturb layers of dust as they advance towards the altar at the end of the nave and set down the bier. Apart from the sickly starlight that filters through the high windows above the nave, the only other source of illumination is the blue light of the processional candles and the dull glow from up in the rafters of human bones. Peering up, you see a glimmering falcon attached to a cross of bone hanging upside down inside an iron cage. When your eyes return to the altar, you see one of the pole bearers fetch a tarnished silver falchion from a recess by the altar and place it across the breast of your motionless comrade. What should we do now? We could attack the pole bearers. We could leave and return back the way we have came. We could use an item, or we could wait to see what happens. They've put a bladed implement on his chest. This is starting to look horribly like a sacrificial dagger, which gives me the impression he might not actually be dead yet. Or perhaps he is. I think we should see if we have an item we can use. Now is probably the time. We don't want to leave it too late. It would be like the Black Hat Llamas. Great story, by the way, if you ever get a chance to read it. But we will attempt a two-point healing roll. And we'll get the same way back. So, yeah, we'll leave that as it is. Okay. It occurs to you with a sudden conviction that you must light the lanterns in your comrade's beer in order to save him. There are two items whose flame might accomplish this. We could use the Orb of Fire. We could. That would be brilliant. But we used it already to defeat the Ice Lacken. Or we could use an Amber Tinder box, which was given to us by um, the Lady in the Forest, who is our ally. Ariadne has it. I was just checking that Sir Alwyn didn't have it on him when he disappeared. <laughs> If we have neither of those items, no, we have. We will use the Amber Tinderbox. You strike the Tinderbox and immediately sparks fly like well-directed missiles from it towards the beer. The lanterns blossom with light and the cowled figures seem blinded by the sudden illumination. They flee in terror and we'll make another two-point healing roll. Goodness sake, game. Come on. Health is lost once again. 
and without even having to scroll to another page, we just look on the opposite page. Suddenly you see your dead comrade stir, then rise to his feet, casting off his winding sheet. You rush to him and find that although he has no memory of anything after the scythe cut him down, he is unharmed. As he has triumphed over death, he now has no concept of fear, and his fighting prowess is increased by one. If he has no concept of fear, does that mean he has no concept of intimidating people? Now, um... Ah... Uh, okay, okay. I would like to... Uh, that's annoying. I'm going to run out of space. It's just going to go huge. So that becomes a 9 up to a 10. Because that is an increase to the base ability score. So I'm actually amending it right there. He is still holding the tarnished silver falchion that was placed over his chest. Engravings on its blade identify it as Shadow Cleaver. The pole bearers also dropped a skull amulet by the altar. If you wish to take it, you may. Right, well, take it if you wish. Um, you know what? This cloak is so drenched with blood from the bridge of blood and gore and bone that it's of not much use to Sir Alwyn anymore. He will discard it and carry the Shadow Cleaver falchion. There we go. You'll notice it hasn't been given any other combat stats. Which means it may be another key item to overcome some puzzle or trap. The pole bearers also dropped a skull amulet by the altar. Well now, would that be of use to us? Or would that be a red herring dummy item we shouldn't take? Um... What would we cast a sight? You know what? Remy's got a lot of health. He can take it. He could ditch his cloak. Um, sure. Actually, his cloak is pretty drenched with blood as well. Yeah, because he used it to hang beneath the bridge as the tide of gore washed over him. His cloak's pretty ruined as well. Yeah. There we go. I might have had an opportunity to heal that section. I didn't take it. This next section, I absolutely will. And we're down to single digits. I'll go a one-point heal. Spend a point, get it back. Fine. You're about to leave this horrible cavern of bone when you notice an archway leading off to the side of the nave where one would normally expect the transept to lie in a godly place of worship. We could investigate this, or we could leave. Let's investigate. And as we do, we'll make another one-point healing roll, because we've still got a lot of endurance to recover. Now, the party's not in dire straits by any means. But we've still got, what, four, six, twelve points to try and get back, so... Spend a point, get it back. Fine. You step towards the archway. Just then, a feeble, high-pitched voice calls out, disturbing the utter silence of the Cathedral of Death. You look up at the stricken falcon hanging from its cage. Hanging in its cage from a rafter. Wait! It cries weakly. Free me, and I may be able to assist you. We can agree to help it, or just ignore it and go for the archway. I think we should agree to help. If anything, this will give us more time to try to heal. It is dangling from its cage some metres above you. Which character class would like to try and get it down first? We've got the Sage, the Trickster, the Enchanter. Well, look, I mean, the Sage can just levitate, but he's going to try a one-point healing roll first. Spends a point, gets two points back, give it to himself, take him back up to ten tiny little bit of recovery after all. Sure. Sage at 351. Levitation is obviously the power you have to use in this case. 
Focus your forts, then see if you succeed in your attempt by turning to either 325 or 30. Right, we're on 351. 352 is the next section. If we reverse those two digits, we get 325. 30 is a long way away. Um, and I remembered in these collaborations, one of the authors wrote all the odd sections, the other one wrote all the even sections, and the one who wrote the odd sections liked the auto kills. Doesn't mean he liked all the failures. Most importantly, this is an odd numbered section, so the person who wrote it definitely wrote one of the two outcomes. We will trust that he wrote the success section and go to 325. Yeah, yeah, a little bit of meta fair for you. <laughs> okay. You feel your feet leave the flagstones beneath them and you drift slowly up to the cage. You easily unlatch the door to it and gently remove the falcon from the pins that were holding it on the crucifix of human bone. You drift back down to the ground of it and make a one-point healing roll on the way. Let's make it a two-point heal. Fuck's sake, game. It knows. It must know. <laughs> We're never going to be on full health for the next fight for the rest of this. No, no, come on, come on. It can happen. It can happen. 560. That's going to be all the way in the middle of these annoying buttons that shouldn't be there. You've helped me, says the Falcon, so I will help you. It gestures over to the archway that leads to the transept, and I feel I'm really going to sneeze any moment soon. How moment? Ah. <coughs> oh, God, there we go. Right. The transept holds a series of ordeals culled from the dreams of myth. Strong sorcery such as that contained in ancient items may be needed. Certainly you should avail yourself of a skull amulet. A handful of silver dust is also advisable. First, however, I would recommend that you tear strips from the winding sheet by the beer over there and soak them in water from the font, then wind them across your lips. So saying, the fountain vanishes. You may do as it suggested. The shroud still lies by the beer, and the font is full of water. Each player must decide whether the fountain gave good advice here and act accordingly. If you didn't take the skull amulet before, go back to where you saw it and pick it up. We did. If you didn't see it before, you won't be able to find it, no matter how hard you look. Meaning that if this encounter played out differently, the amulet might not even be there. So well, if we... If we failed to save Sir Alwyn, would the Skull Amulet not be there? If we somehow... I'd... Mm, yeah, well... <laughs> Let's just be grateful he's alive once again. We will... Soak strips of the Shroud in the water font. Even though this is a Cathedral of Death, it may still be Holy Ground. So there may be some blessed power protection. Let's go for it. We can now enter the transept or leave. We shall absolutely enter. We have been instructed. This is a series of challenges. I think there might have been some mention of powerful treasure at the end. Let's, let's go for it. You enter the transept. The walls here are fashioned from skeletal hands that reach out into the room as though in a frozen gesture of supplication. A sense of foreboding almost overwhelms you. Uh, including the foreboding that this one-point healing roll will not go well. What did I just say? If an enchanter or enchantress wishes to cast prediction, yeah, absolutely, let's do that. Extra section means extra healing roll. The curtain of time, opaque to mortal eyes, flutters aside and allows you to glimpse into possible futures. You see a series of ordeals. First you will be subjected to ordeal by disease, then by terror, then by destruction, and then forgetfulness. 
Lastly, you go to confront the greatest challenge of all, but no, the vision clouds. You step back, beads of sweat soaking your face, too shaken to cast the spell again for a moment. For, for the moment, and we will try another one point healing roll. And we will lose the point of heal. This is actually getting a bit serious now. We shall go on. Fearsome though this ordeal may seem. Darkness settles all around you. You seem to hear a morbid chattering from the walls and then a wheezing chuckle. But when you thrust your torch forwards, you see no sign of motion. A howling wind whistles past, bringing on it a hundred plagues and ailments. It is the wind of decay, and you must weather it or suffer the consequences. Roll one die for each of the five ailments listed below. Each player must do this. The player can track the ailment on a score of one or two. Add one to the die rolls if you previously wound a wet strip of shroud over your face. Add two to the rolls if you are holding the orb of plague, which sucks the diseased spirits from yourself. In other words, if you're holding the orb of plague, you're not going to... So only on a one. Um, since these look all pretty bad, we're going to try another one-point healing roll. Oh, game, you are cruel! Uh, I, I really think we should um, possibly move Brother Kern to the back behind Ariadne. It's starting to look really bad. Okay, diseases. One, two, three, four, five. Let's try not to get any. You know what? Sir Alwyn does not gain malaria. Does not gain typhoid. Does not acquire soul bite. Neither does he suffer haemophilia or the wasting rot. He is unaffected by all the diseases. Now we'll move on to Remy. One, two, three. Oh, third one got him. That is Soul Bite. Uh, these effects last for the rest of the adventure. So it's temporary. So Remy's psychic ability has been reduced to five. That's rather low. Actually, that could be really bad when it comes to the terror. And there's still two more for him to go. Oh my goodness. He's also acquired haemophilia. Yeah, I'll, I'll put him in here. So the soul bite is minus one. The haemophilia is takes an extra point of damage every time he suffers a wound. Right, Brother Kern. Good. Not so good. Oh, bugger, that's... That's typhoid. Okay, that's bad. His fighting prowess has been reduced to six. Well, given that he only has five current endurance points, we should attempt to keep him out of combat at all costs. Okay, that's okay, that's good, that's good, that is good. And finally, Ariadne. So far, a two, a four, a four, a four, and a two. I see Map Tool's sticky dice is becoming a problem. One moment, please. That's rolling a D100 and a D20. Doesn't matter which one you do first. Allegedly resets the dice. Nobody got the Wasting Rot, which is pretty good. But one person with haemophilia is bad. We shall push onwards further into this series of ordeals. Here we go. 
In this part of the transept, the walls are formed of damp clay. Cavernous mouths gape at you from the shadows, making a macabre sound, the groan of doom. If you have an iron bell, it rings loudly now of its own accord and drowns out the terrible groaning. If you do not have the bell, which we blatantly do, because the, the seer in the village gave it to us, you are demoralised by the noise, and each player must halve his or her fighting prowess, rounding fractions up for the rest of the adventure. That would be horrific! We are going to risk a one-point healing roll. Oh, right, yeah. And we lose it. If I go down to three, I'm going to have to stop. Given that the odds of losing a healing roll are so low, this is painful. <laughs> I mean, this is like three episodes in a row where it's just been tragic, right? There's something dodgy going on. Ooh. I'm making a one-point healing roll right now for this section. Game, fuck you. Seriously. Map tools, sticky dice are a major problem. Right, let's clear chat. Where's that D1000? And then we'll clear again and continue. You step into a zone of utter blackness. Lights appear and sound w and slowly weave towards you. The glowing, enticing eyes of the handmaidens of oblivion. Oh, are these the forgetfulness one? Tiosked. You can see them now in the soft glow, dimly, their thin lips ready to administer the kiss of death. If you have any silver dust, you can fling it now into their hypnotic eyes, causing them to flee. Remember to cross it off your character sheet. That sounds like a really good thing to do. Ariadne makes good use of the silver dust. She probably hands it out to all of them and they each throw some. If you do not have the dust, they reach out to embrace you. Each player must roll the psychic ability on or less on two dice or else vanish from this world forever. If a player vanishes, so does any equipment he or she is carrying. Not something we were told when Sir Alwyn disappeared. Surviving characters may go deeper into the transept, and so we shall. And, because of how horrible this is, I think I need to try another one-point healing roll. A one-point healing roll. We're down to two endurance here on our healer. This is really bad. You are walking on flagstones carpeted with dead leaves. A faint, dry breeze rustles them eerily. Slowly, to your horror, they rise up and clump together to form a vaguely recognisable shape, something like a tall, hunched man in a long cloak. This ordeal is for leaves of remembrance which snatch away the mind's memories. If you have an amber tinder box, which we have, or the orb of fire, you can quickly produce a magical flame. The dry leaves catch a light in seconds, emitting a hollow wail as they burn, and you may pass by in safety. If you use the tinderbox, then you retain it. But if you use the orb, then you must cross it off your character sheet, as it is too hot now to pick up. Whether without the tinderbox or the orb, you cannot stop the leaves rolling over you. Each player loses all recollection of his or her past life and skills, becoming a second-rank character in all aspects. Fortunately, we were able to produce a magical flame, so that didn't happen to us. We shall go even deeper into the transept, and this will be our last opportunity to try a one-point healing roll any time soon. Brother Kern now has one endurance. We are moving him to the back of the party. We will not be able to heal again unless we win a fight 
and use the golden snuff box of Shormiano and roll correctly for him to not die. That is way too risky. We might just have to leave him at the back on one health. With his reduced fighting prowess, it's not really worth giving him any arrows either. Blimey. You are at the end of the transept. An archway lies ahead, but the way is blocked by a giant warrior. Strange armour of violet jewels and ebony plaques hangs from about his huge frame. From the depths of his necroid helm you glimpse a bony smile. He stands with his hands enclosed in gauntlets of black metal, resting on the hilt of his jagged-edged sword. The blade's point rests on the cracked flagstones by his feet, where you see a gathering of dust accumulated through the centuries. He has stood guarding here before the arch, and there we see his sword on the cracked flagstones, and the dust around his feet, actually. I am Thanatos, he declares in rumbling tones, suggesting the approach of thunder. I am ready to meet in battle any who would pass beyond this point in single combat, or must attack from any too craven to duel equally. I think. Ah, oh, Brother Kernich is so crippled, we're going to be down a party member. But I think... Ariadne should call a spell to mind. And because we don't quite know what manner of foe we'll be facing, we'll go with a trusty sword thrust spell. For now, until we know better. Night Helm might be good. The Eye of the Tiger could be very helpful. We can't risk Brother Kern taking damage. He's too messed up already at the moment. He will have to look on and pray that the others can triumph without him. We can retreat through the Leaves of Remembrance. Probably not a good idea. Uh, one person could step forward to challenge him to single combat. That would be the fearless Sir uh, Alwyn, but honestly, we got Heraklos and Bloodgatrank of a giant slaying sword. We should put both those weapons to good use. So we're going to go group fight, I think. Yeah. Two or more players? Sure. You utter a lusty battle cry and charge forwards together, intent on the destruction of your giant foe. Thanatos hefts his mighty weapon and displays the jagged teeth that run along its cutting edge. Whether I stand alone against one or many, the outcome is as sure, he bellows. Thanatos the giant, called out as a giant. The giant slaying sword will aid us here. Let's go prepare a map and see you soon. So here we are. This fight is going to be tough for a number of reasons. Ideally, we would have been going into this fight with more than one endurance point on every party member. Preferably with everyone at full health. Additionally, there are a number of diseases that have ravaged the party. Sir Alwyn remains mercifully unaffected. Remy has reduced psychic ability. Not that Thanatos the Giant is going to be doing any psychic attacks, mercifully. And he also um, has haemophilia, which means he takes an additional point of damage every time he gets hit. Brother Kern is so badly hurt he can't even join in the fight, unless it becomes an emergency. Ariadne is pretty much, yeah, she's unaffected by diseases, that went very well. Thanatos deals 4d6 damage on a successful hit. This means that he can drop Sir Alwyn in two hits. Uh, could theoretically drop Remy in one. Bit of an edge case. 
but generally he could drop any party member in two hits. We are not going to be doing 45 points of damage with two points of armor on top of that in the amount of time it would take him to do four hits, so there's going to need to be a lot of strategic defending. Additionally, this is one of those emergency fights where I will be pulling out Remy's quick thinking ability. We're probably going to have to use the scroll of time blink as well. So, let's start with Remy moving in here to attack with the giant slaying sword. That is a miss and probably way, way the whole fight's going to go. You know what? I didn't move the initiative onto him, so I could arguably, but no, no, I've rolled it already. Okay, Thanatos will randomize a target. He goes for the warrior. And hits for an awe-inspiring 13 damage, minus free armor. You know what? I've cocked this up completely, haven't I? Yes, I have. I'm going to walk this back. Absolutely. For the blatantly obvious reason. Reset round timer. Put Remy back where he was. And Brother Kern should give his charm of shielding to someone. Remy takes an extra point of damage every time he gets hit, so giving it to him for an extra point of armor would make sense. We also want to keep attacking. Um... Yes, we'll give it to Remy. Okay. The shielding charm will go to Remy, who will hand the skull amulet, which we haven't had to use here at all yet, to Brother Kern. This means that armor value goes down to 2, this armor value goes up to 3. We can't give Blutgetranka to Sir Alwyn to use instead of the Axe of Heraklos. So we'd have to, like, give Ariadne's Enchanted Sword to Remy and then Blutgetranka. So we might as well have the two magic weapons. So now that I've corrected that blatant mistake... Um, because I had the dice rolls up here from the end of the... Yeah, sure, what the hell. The terrible healing rolls. So we'll do that all again. And that didn't even cost me a scroll of time blink. That was me realising a dreadful mistake early before it could go all kinds of horribly wrong. So Remy's going to come in here and attack. Probably with slightly more accurate results than before. There we go. And the magic giant slaying sword takes full effect against the giant... Plus one, is it? Plus one, it is. Eye of the Tiger may be the way to go here. That was garbage. Rolled one point higher than his armor. And I didn't even put the initiative on him. Okay, Thanatos will select a target. He will go for Remy who is ever so slightly harder to hit. And I say that in the hope that it will somehow increase the chances of him not taking damage. No, he's taking damage. He is dead. Uh, four dice. 18. Yeah, okay. Okay, okay. Remy goes down. Scroll of Time Blink gets used. We go back to the beginning of the fight. Reset the round counter. Everyone goes back up to full health, meaning we restore one point of damage to Thanatos the Giant. And Remy goes back up to 12. And then we hope this goes ever so slightly different. What we could do, arguably, is have Remy defend here. Thanatos attacks Sir Alwyn, who cannot defend. Sir Alwyn then defends. Remy comes in, attacks twice, then gets crushed by... No, we just have to go in and... We need to go in heavy and just... No. We put Remy back where he is, give him the initiative... So that we don't have an excuse for cocking up. Then we make an attack. And hit. 
four. Eight points of damage, that's ever so slightly better. Six points takes him down to 39. Final Sauce for Giant will randomize a target. He goes for the Trickster. Of course he does. He hits because the dice love the monsters tonight. He does 13, 14 points of damage, minus three armor. It's going to be 11. Oh my god, Remy's down to one endurance. And yes, I did in add in the extra point for bleeding there. Right. And I didn't even start his turn. Is that it? Is that why the game's being horrid to me? Okay. Ariadne. Please try. 2d6 plus 2. The Sword Frost spell manifests, so we get the full 3d6 plus 3 damage. Please be high. 15. Excellent. 2. Armor is 13. Takes him down to 26. This begins to look ever so slightly more believable at this point, but that's not saying much. Okay. Thing is, if we do cast Night Howl at him, he's got a psychic ability of 8, so he's only got a 4 in 11 chance of failing with resistance roll. It's not good. We either boost ourselves or focus high on the damage, hard on the damage. Speaking of focusing on the damage, let's see if Sir Alwyn can deal some. Attack with that magic axe. There we go. D6 plus free damage is a lowly five. That's free after armor. Takes him down to 23. That's about half health. And as Brother Kern is defending, Remy will blatantly make use of his quick thinking ability to strike again. And hits for 2d6 plus 1. Damage, please. 9 points. Excellent. It's okay. It's 7 after armor. Takes him down to 16. And then we start the new round with Remy on 1 endurance point. He needs to defend. Because we don't know who Thanatos will attack. We could attack again. And maybe do like another 5 or 6 damage. And then get killed. But we could defend and get... No, no, no. Just defend. Defend. It'll be fine. And Thanatos chooses his target. He goes for Sir Alwyn. Excellent. I mean, it would be nice if he could miss an attack, but he did not. 15 damage. Good grief he can't roll low. Well, we got three points of armor, so that's a mere 12 points, knocking him down to six endurance. Guess what? That feels horrible. Ariadne needs to prepare a spell. Um, at this point, honestly, trying to nuke him down with another sword thrust is probably a good idea. So we'll go with that. So Alwyn will decide it's now or never and just attack with his axe. Because it is getting that desperate. That's a hit. Look, he's fearless at the moment, right? Allegedly. On d6 plus 3. 7 damage. 5 points after armor takes him down to 11. And that ends the round. I think... Ooh... I think Remy has to attack, because he can't take both of them out this round. Remy hits. Let's have a nice high damage roll, please. That was not high. Takes him down to nine endurance, though. And we have the optional rule of survival, which we're going to blooming well need, because Thanatos is going to pick a target and absolutely victimise somebody. He goes for the trickster, of course he does. Can we have a miss, please? 13! He misses! Excellent! Maximum on the attack dice. Hooray! Remy's still in the game. Ariadne, please try. Please, please, please try for that Sword Frost spell. That is a success. Let's have some mega damage. And possibly Sir Alwyn can finish him off if you don't. Nine. Seven after... Oh, takes him down to two. 
If he had no armor, that would have been a kill. Uh, come on, brave knight. Slay this foe. Uh, no, 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 plus. No, 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 just, just attack roll. This isn't a damage roll. Eight is a hit. Excellent. 1d6 plus 3. We need to roll a 2 or higher. And I really shouldn't have said that because I probably jinxed it. 5 minus 2 armor is free damage. Thanatos is destroyed. Oh, yes. And then, in the interest of extreme recklessness and how absolutely shagged the party are, we're going to use the golden snuff box of Show Me Arno oh, and really screw ourselves over. So, Remy! Heals. One whole point of endurance. Okay. Sir Alwyn. Heals. Six whole points of endurance. Hey! Uh, don't jinx it. Brother Kern. Heals. Six points of endurance, taking him up to seven. Oh, healing can resume again. And Ariadne loses six points of endurance. <coughs> well, at least she's the only one who could actually afford to do that. Oh, the fight is at an end. Excellent. Oh, wow. Okay. Clearly, life is not allowed to flourish in this Cathedral of Death. Stepping over Thanatos' body, you take a look at the chamber he was guarding. It is just a bare, circular room, not very large, illuminated by a lamp that hangs from a vaulted roof. A single item stands in the center of the floor, but when you step forwards to investigate, you see that it is an extraordinary item indeed. A proud battle standard of the First Legion of Imperial Silentium. It must be almost a thousand years old, and an object of veneration throughout the civilized world. Dazed, you reach out to take it. You can almost imagine the ghosts of previous wielders of this battle standard speaking to you, imparting the dauntless wisdom of a bygone age. The battle standard gives you the spirit to face the horrors of the transept again. But when you retrace your steps, you find they have all vanished. Returning to the nave, to, returning to the echoing nave, you stride to the doors of the Cathedral of Death and leave. I think Sir Alwyn has earned this. We'll ditch the wolf's paw. Battle standard of the first legion. of Salentium. There we go. And I did say something about a one-point heal. I'm pretty sure I did. If I didn't, it's happening now. No, it's not. Cathedral of Death says, Fuck you, Brother Kern. Keep losing health. Oh, man. Um... Right, I'd better check episode length and see if I should stop here. I probably should before continuing, to be honest. Or if I should continue. Back in a bit. It's looking like a good episode length. So, I'm going to leave this one here. I will try a one-point healing roll now that we are outside the Cathedral of Death for this section. Hey, and get two points back. Back up to seven again. All right. So, I am going to not read this section. I'll, I'll start with that one next time. We have no healing roll. I hope you've all enjoyed this episode because I'm going to wrap this one up now and I'll look forward to seeing you all in the very next one. I'll say goodbye for now though and cheerio everyone. See you all soon. <laughs>